um, we're going to start in just a second. I want to just thank all of you again for being here and giving up an hour of your day to be advocates for the separation of church and state and so many of the other issues that we've got to talk about. Um, I'll introduce Sarah in just a second, but I just want to remind everybody we are recording the session. That way you and anyone else who couldn't make it can watch this again. I'm going to send the link out like first thing tomorrow morning. Uh, if you have a question, um, it would be helpful if you hit like the raise hand button or did a chat window or something like that and just asked your question there. Uh, so we can give Sarah as much time as possible tonight to answer all your questions. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, but again, I do want to thank all of you for, for being a part of this. Um, let's see. I think that's that's pretty much all of my introduction. I'm going to talk about a few announcements towards the end. Uh, so after Sarah wraps up, don't run away just yet. I want to give you some announcements. Um, but I am so thrilled to have Sarah with us again. Uh, not only has she helped us last year with the same event when we um, when we did this, but uh, Sarah and I go way back with California Free Thought Day. She's been a speaker for many years. She uh, was working. She worked for many, many years with the Secular Coalition for America. Um, and I've just always been so impressed by her ability to take these complex issues and to turn them not only into something that we can understand with all the legalese, uh, but also to help us advocate for them. Because I think if there isn't someone like Sarah doing this, then we're all doing our own separate thing. And we all know that our voice is a lot stronger when we're combined with a leader like Sarah behind us. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and give her pretty much the rest of the hour. And like I said, just a couple announcements after that. So Sarah, you are welcome to share your screen. I'm going to ask everybody else to put you on, yourselves on mute. And if I hear like a dog barking or something, I'm going to try and mute you. Just don't be offended if I, if I, if I hit your mute button for you. Sarah, they are all yours. Awesome. Thank you, David. And I do need screen sharing powers, um, if you could grant that oh. because I think I'm still technically a participant. Yeah, let me do that right now. <laughs> there you go. Try it again. Awesome. Um, and while I'm pulling that up, I really want to recognize, um, I, I see a lot of faces I recognize um, from last year and from um, working with you all. Um, so welcome back. Great to see you. Oh, sorry about that. Let me turn off my notifications. Um, and uh, I, but I also really want to give a shout out to all the folks who are here doing advocacy for the first time or, or for the first time in a while. Um, and I hope for those of you who are doing this uh, for the first time that um, I, I'll tell you that I've worked with a lot of people who become addicted to advocacy like this after they do it for the first time. I, it, a lot of folks um, think it's this kind of like mysterious thing that just, you know, paid lobbyists like myself do that you have to have some sort of special expertise or PhD or something like that to do this kind of work. Um, but it really is um, not that hard. It's really exciting. Um, and I've, I've had the pleasure of training a lot of folks to do this for the first time. And my goal is always to get you hooked on it so that you do it all year round build and get um, into the mode of um, building relationships with your lawmakers regularly. Um, so let's get started. Um, I'm going to teach you today, um, and I know a lot of, uh, you know, for the folks who know how to do this, this is um, not going to be new information, uh, but, you know, we want to make sure that folks who are advocating for the first time, um, you know, get, get a sort of overview of how to do this. So First, I want to start with just explaining what lobbying versus advocacy is. Um, so basically, all lobbying is advocacy, but not all advocacy is lobbying, right? So advocacy is a really broad word, and it doesn't always necessarily have to involve uh, being uh, in, in a room with legislators or their staff, right? There's all kinds of advocacy. Education is a big part of advocacy, right? Spreading awareness about an issue, uh, writing letters to the editor and op-eds about an issue, which is also part of education and raising awareness, building coalitions um, with groups and interests that have that share common ground with you uh, is part of the advocacy work. There's there's it's, it's really anything that has to do with moving an issue forward and not just in the area of legislation is advocacy. Um, changing hearts and minds right um, around an issue is advocacy. But lobbying is very specifically trying to get the decision makers, um, lawmakers, government officials who can impact policy to um, 
to make decisions, right, for or against uh, or, you know, moving forward an issue. So I also want to talk a, a little bit about grass tops versus grassroots advocacy uh, because and, and lobbying. Um, so grass tops advocacy and lobbying is like the paid lobbyist like me, right? You're, you're, uh, you've got Allison Gill at American Atheist, you've got um, uh, lobbyists at the national level with the American Humanist Association, CFI, and all these lobbyists are doing grass top stuff. So they're the ones who are representing organizations um, that then trickle down, of course, represent all of their members, right? So walking, when I was at the Secular Coalition for America, walking into an office and saying that I represent the Secular Coalition and it's 20, me member organ 20 national member organizations and the millions of Americans who, un who are unaffiliated, um, that's, that's that grass tops. Um, but what you're doing today is grassroots and it's actually, they work together and neither is more important than the other. I really wanna emphasize again that, you know, you don't have to be, uh, you know, a professional lobbyist to be, uh, the. that doesn't make you the important person in the room. It's just a different role. Because when I move, when I would walk into any office um, on the Hill, and this is true anywhere, I, they don't really care what I have to say unless I have people power behind me, right? Because I'm not a voter. I'm not their constituent. I'm there to deliver the message on behalf of the constituents. Um, and so with grass tops lobbying doesn't really go very far unless you've got the grassroots lobbying and advocacy behind you. So they really do work together. And I also want to note because a number of you are involved in or members of maybe also leaders of uh, local groups and a huge misconception about lobbying um, and advocacy more, more generally is that you can't do it if you're a 501c3. False, not true <laughs> at all. Um, there are rules, uh, you know, there are, there is a limit to the amount of lobbying that um, a 501c3 can do and outside of lobbying, um, advocacy, you know, any amount of education that you're doing about an issue, uh, you can do any amount of that, right? You can you can meet with legislators and educate them about issues all day long. The moment that you are saying, I want you to support or oppose this legislation or act on this specific regulation, that's when it's lobbying. But even that, you can do, you can use up to 20% of your total resources as a C3 um, on lobbying, which is quite generous. Um, it's very rare that you're going to have uh, a local group spending, you know, up 20% um, of, of their resources. Um, and, uh, you know, that there are different, it's a little bit more complicated than that. There's different ways of measuring that. Um, and there's also, you know, kind of variance in, in state law as well. So a really great resource for that is um, an organization called Alliance for Justice. Um, they're both, they have a campaign, or sorry, the whole website called Boulder Advocacy. And all Boulder Advocacy does is help advise C3s and provides resources around how they can lobby and advocate um, within um, the letter of the law. Um, and I wanna, the reason I include this is because 501c3s include houses of worship, all, pretty much all houses of worship are 501c3s. They not only engage in lobbying and advocacy up to the letter of the law, on the other side, our opposition, the Christian right, they violate the law openly all the time and are not held accountable for it. So the last thing we want our humanists and secular groups to do is to be hesitant about doing what we can do legally, right? We don't want to, we don't want to be like them and step over the, you know, over the line. There's so much we can do legally. Um, but we know that they are very, very active. And so we need to be active too. So I really want to wanted to share that here. Um, so you can take that back to your groups and really encourage them um, to get involved in this kind of work because they absolutely can. All right. So why do we lie? Um, first and foremost, if you're not speaking out about where you stand on the issue, someone else is speaking for you, right? Um, our opposition um, is absolutely vocal. Uh, they are talking to their legislators. They have, you know, entire institutions that they have built uh, for decades to have constituent outreach happening all of the time. And so few people do what we're doing um, as part of this advocacy week coming up that, you know, a really sm a small you know, group of people can have an outsized impact because simply of just 
who people are hearing from. And it's really important to remember that you can have, you can show polls all day long and say, well, X percent of Californians stand uh, here on this issue. But if those Californians aren't showing up to vote, um, you know, what, what does that matter to someone who's thinking about their next reelection, right? Their calculation isn't always necessarily based on just where are the majority of constituents, it's where are the constituents that are engaged, the constituents that are showing up. So showing up really, really matters, um, not just because someone else is going to speak for you if you don't, but because, you know, with just a little bit of effort, you can have a really huge impact. And, you know, that gets to that second point, right? The squeaky wheel gets the grease. Um, I, I can tell you just from experience, I'm working on a bill in New York where I had a constituent, just one, one constituent meet uh, with his state senator. Most of the time it's just staff that shows up, but it was um, state senator herself. She stayed for, uh, this is very unusual, you usually get 10 or 15 minutes with a legislator. She stayed for an hour and a half. She was really engaged in the, engaged in the issues. And guess what? She co-sponsored the bill a few weeks later because she had a meeting with one constituent, right? So it, it really didn't take that much. It took that one meeting explaining the issues. He, it wasn't 50 people, it wasn't five people, it was one constituent who made his case um, and got what he asked for, right? So, you know, just, just being present, even in small numbers can have a really big impact. Um, playing the long game, I, this, this may not resonate as much in California, um, right? But the, the reality, but I, I think you all, we were talking about Roe v. Wade earlier, right? We're in a really, really uh, dark place right now in, in our country. Uh, and so, you know, we can feel good about, uh, you know, where we are as Californians, but we know, um, and I think all of us care about what happens to Americans outside of our state borders, right? Um, millions of Americans are going to lose their ability to make decisions about their uh, about their bodies. And so um, what happens here really matters. And, and in terms of the national picture, um, the reason I talk about playing the long game is that I know that sometimes it can feel so frustrating to be losing these huge battles. Um, and it's not going to get better anytime soon. I, I do, I'm not going to, you know, sugarcoat it. But I will say that if you think about the fact that the Christian right started organizing decades ago, they started planting those seeds decades ago. They started working on getting people on the school boards and they started local and then they, and they started the Federalist Society and built that over time. They are reaping uh, what, they, what they sowed a few uh, uh, decades ago. And so for us to undo that and to then advance proactive, secular, pluralistic policies, we have decades of work ahead of us. That doesn't mean it's impossible. It doesn't mean it's insurmountable, um, but we need to have that long view and see everything that we do as getting us to that point, right? So we have to be in a place where secular people, secularists like you and me are just as vocal and building all of those institutions um, and organizing in a sophisticated way, just like the Christian right. Um, and so I, I say that not to not to be uh, depressing or anything, but to really kind of level set what we're doing here. We are building um, up to uh, hopefully in a few decades being just as powerful. And the good news is that we do have demographic numbers on our side. That doesn't mean it's just going to happen, right? The country is becoming rapidly secularizing. One in three millennials are religiously unaffiliated, um, even more with Gen Z. Um, and it's not this whole idea that, oh, they'll just get more religious when they're older. That's not going to happen. We don't, the data shows that, that they're, they're not coming back. Um, and they're very progressive on, on the issues that we care about, such as reproductive choice. So that's, that's good. The base of the Christian right, which is older, whiter Christian is decreasing, but that doesn't mean that we can't um, end up in a place where we have minority rule, right? So we have kind of the ingredients to be successful. We have, you know, the numbers on our side, but the advocacy in the, having the advocacy in place, having regular outreach um, and building um, and getting increased representation in government, all of these things, we're playing the long game there. Right. And, and that's OK. We just have to be really focused on what that long term vision is 
and accept that, yes, we might lose a lot of battles along the way, but I personally believe that the culture war that the Christian right has started, they are losing, right? They are not in step with the American people. So that's another thing that's in our favor. I think what the values that we believe in are shared by a lot of Americans, including, including a lot of people of faith. And so if we focus on playing that long game and getting really good at the kinds of things that I'm going to talk about today, like lobbying, but also getting involved in electoral politics, helping the candidates win who represent our values, addressing those root cause issues that are leading to kind of minority rule, that, that's, that's really important. So I just wanted to kind of give you that, that level setting there. Visibility is another reason why we lobby. Sometimes uh, you're, when you have a meeting with a legislator or their staff, you, you might be the first open humanist or atheist they've ever met um, and, or at least talked to in, in about you know, policy issues. They may have met, met an atheist, but they may, they may not have connected the dots between, oh, okay, so non-religious people actually have an agenda and a point of view and, and it's important and it should be heard. Um, and again, I think I mentioned this earlier, um, sometimes uh, you actually build relationships and get staff and legislators to come out to you. I've had that experience as a lobbyist. I've had constituents that I've worked with at Lobby Days have that experience where a staff member will tell them, oh, I'm an atheist too, right? I even had uh, Republicans on the Hill, Republican staffers would like whisper to me, they'd be like, I'm an atheist, but I think I'm the only one. And then that happened a second and a third time. I was like, you guys aren't the only one. You really need to talk to each other. Um, but, but really, you know, in all seriousness, the the knowing that your groups exist is hugely important because if we want to live in a world where elected officials and candidates just like they you know make their rounds to all the houses of worship and and you know build relationships with faith leaders in the community we want them to think about humanists and atheist leaders in the same way right they want we want them to be trying to come to our groups to speak and shake hands with our members and you know know and build relationships with our leaders, right? Um, but to do that, they need to know we exist and they need to know what we're all about because unfortunately, unlike people of faith, we have a lot of stereotypes and stigma that we're up against. And so not only are we um, oftentimes invisible and just not known, we're also you know, running up against kind of misconceptions about who we are and what we're all about. And so we need to be the ones who are speaking for ourselves, saying what we're about um, and saying, you know, this, this, these are our values and this is what we stand for, which is going to help us get to that place um, where they're coming to us, just like they come to faith leaders. So that's why we lobby. Let's talk about how you prepare for a, a lobby meeting. So um, to prepare you, the most important thing, you know, you obviously you, you want to know about the bill that you're talking about, be able to explain it. But one of the most important things to do in a meeting is to explain your personal connection to the issue. Why does this matter to you? How does this impact your um, fellow constituents in this legislator's district? How does this affect Californians, right? Because at the end of the day, you're talking to a human being, right? And human beings are really motivated by stories um, and understanding how does this connect to my life, right? So you, of course, you want to have all the talking points and what the bill does. But first and foremost, think about in your own words, as you, as when we get to the part about the bills we're going to talk about, Think about how you would say in a conversation, maybe with a family member or a friend, if you were to explain in terms of your secular values or humanist values, just why you care, you can exactly how you would say that in conversation is how you would say it in a meeting like this. And then, of course, you want to familiar, familiarize yourself with the top talking points, you know, the, the main things. You don't have to memorize every single thing. You just want to really hit the most important things. The most important thing is the why, you know, like why does this bill, why do we need this bill? Um, what problem is it addressing? Um, why it matters to you, the, what the bill will do, so the why, the what, um, and, you know, ultimately making the ask of, and therefore we urge you to support or oppose this bill. Um, one thing that I think really gets people nervous that there's no reason to be nervous about is well, what if they ask me something I don't know? It's totally okay to just say, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I will absolutely, I'm going to write that down and I will get back to you. And then you actually do, right? So, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, 
what you don't want to do is make something up or fudge it ever, right? Because when it comes to advocacy and lobbying, one of the most, the, the currency is integrity, right? Integrity and trust. You want to be a reliable source of information. I actually want to take a second to talk about that too. Um, when you think about an elected official or their staff, they have subject matter expertise on like this much, right? They can't know everything about everything, but they do have to vote on everything. And so even if they have staff, and in California, you have, you know, legislators with staff in other states, you know, they have maybe one, if, if any, depending on the state. But even in California, where they have staff, the staff know about this much, right? So they rely a lot on trusted outside organizations and interest groups that have expertise in certain issues to tell them what's up about a bill, right? So when they have a bill that they need to vote on and take a position on, if they don't have um, expertise, and even if they do, you know, they often want to kind of understand who's for this and why, who's against this and why to kind of weigh their options, right? And so being a sub establishing yourself as a subject matter expert in an issue area is, it is so, so powerful. Um, I can give you an example of that. So I was lobbying for the DC Death with Dignity Act. For those of you who aren't familiar with that issue, um, death with dignity legislation gives people who are terminally ill, who have six months or less to live, the opportunity to request medication to end their life on their own terms. Um, and there's a lot of misinformation that uh, the opposition, which includes usually the Catholic Church, um, that goes around when um, there's, there's a bill um, in, for consideration. And I was meeting with a council member's office and the, the bill was only six pages long, but it was very clear that they hadn't read it, right? And that can happen, right? They have so much that they have to look at. They don't actually necessarily read every single bill sometimes. And the staffer said to me, you know, uh, we're a little concerned about this bill because um, it would apply to people with diabetes. That was false. It was just completely false. And I know that they got it from the opposition that misinformed them about the bill and lied to them about it. And so I, you know, very diplomatically explained like, no, that's actually not true. You can see here that it says it only applies to people with a terminal illness and they actually have to get, they have to see two different doctors to confirm the diagnosis, et cetera, et cetera. And what was important in that moment was not just that I gave them the correct information, established myself as a subject matter expert, as someone who is a reliable source of information, but also, do you think they're ever going to listen to anything, whoever that person or that organization was that lied to them, you think they're ever going to take anything they have to say seriously again? Absolutely not, right? And so it's totally okay to not know but when you come back, you would say, and, and we will help you with this. If you don't know the answer, you go get it. You come back and you say, you asked me this question, wanted to make sure you had the information. Let me know if there's anything else you need. And that's just as good. Okay. So another thing you want to do to prepare for a meeting is knowing the legislator. Um, because there's, there's certain things that will kind of help determine um, how that meeting, how you approach that meeting. So for example, if they are on the committee that is, um, that is going to be hearing that, that where the bill has to go through, then, um, you know, that's, a that's something you're going to want to know, right? So you're going to want to, uh, you know, ask them to make sure to do everything they can to make sure it's voted out of their committee. Um, if they have a, a leadership position, if they are maybe the speaker of the house or uh, the deputy whip or something like that, you just want to know going in, um, should your ask be a, a little bit more refined because not only can they, you know, co-sponsor or not, or, or not, or, or vote for or against, they also have other ways that they can support or oppose the bill that you're advocating for. Um, and then their voting record, right? You wanna kind of go in knowing like, is this potentially someone who's an ally? Is this someone who might be a detractor based on their voting record on other things? Um, and for these bills, and we'll give you the, uh, the links um, so that you'll be able to see, if they're a co-sponsor. So some of you, your reps will have already co-sponsored the bills 
that we're advocating for, which means you're not going to go in and say, please support this bill. You're going to go in and say, thank you for co-sponsoring this bill. We really appreciate it. This is why it's so important to us, which is still really valuable. You want to reinforce that you're still getting in that visibility. And it's also pressure, but like just because they co-sponsored it doesn't mean it's a priority for them, right? They could co-sponsor all kinds of bills, but how they're spending their time, you know, you might be able to get them to say, oh, okay, I've heard from a lot of constituents around this bill. They really care about it. So I'm going to make sure we're on it, right? So, and then finally, you want to have materials prepared and we've done this for you, um, but this is actually not very hard to do. Um, you know, it's really just about putting together uh, a few um, high level talking points about, um, again, what what is the problem that needs to be solved, the basic background necessary to understand the issue, um, what the bill does and why it's important to you and why it's important to their constituents, Californians generally, um, to, to support what the bill does. So that's preparation. Um, so we're, we're gonna be encouraging you to schedule meetings in person if you feel comfortable in your district offices. And this is really important because it just, there's nothing that replaces those personal relationships, right? And again, so few people show up in person to do these kinds of meetings that it just really signals to them that you are a very engaged community. And one of the things I would really encourage you to do, in addition to, of course, mentioning that you're a volunteer with California Free Thought Day, if you are associated with a group, let's just say I'm going to pick on, you know, Atheists of San Jose, you're going to want to go in and tell them, um, you know, I'm, I'm a secular constituent. I am a volunteer with California Free Thought Day, and I'm a member, board member, whatever it is, of Atheists of San Jose. The reason for that is that in their minds, when you say that, they're multiplying you in their head, right? Because they know that you're with a group, and so you're representing a broader constituency in their district. Um, so if you, this is, so this is all kind of around the in-person, um, but it also the virtual, right? So dress professionally, um, don't be in a tank top and flip-flops, right? You don't have to have a full suit, but just, you know, dress how you would for an interview, right? Um, know who you're meeting with. Um, meetings with staffers are just as important. Don't, don't be insulted if you're not getting a meeting with the legislator. In fact, meeting with staff is sometimes even better because they're the ones who do the work. They're the ones who actually some, sometimes are putting together those memos and recommendations for their boss. Um, and they're really the gatekeepers in a lot of ways. So you really, you know, any lobbyist um, is, is not just focusing on trying to build a relationship with the legislator themselves. It's really about building relationships with the staff that are working on the issues that you're lobbying for. Um, and, you know, if whether like whether you're if, if even if you think you're dealing with an intern just always be really kind and courteous because these folks are the gatekeepers right so you want to be um as polite and courteous as possible um and you know don't don't be you know miffed if you're you know not getting a meeting with the legislator um it, it's great to meet with staff of course be on time um and if you're in a group um a few of you are in um, the same district. So we'll be um, making sure that you're all in contact with each other when you're requesting your meeting so you can um, attend as a group. You just really want to make sure that you're not talking over each other, right? You want to be kind of just organized. So just beforehand decide who's going to be maybe the primary speaker, or who's going to speak first, who's going to speak second, just so it goes really smoothly. And so you don't run out of time because sometimes you might only have 10 or 15 minutes and you want to make sure that you get to everything. So you're at the meeting. What do you do? So the first thing you do is you open with a thank you and you can just thank them for their time. But if there are other things that you know the legislator has supported um, that you that uh, that you also support, even, even if it's not a bill that's, that you're lobbying on today, uh, or that, you know, it has anything to do with church state separation, it could be anything. If you know that they supported something that you like, just throw it in there. Anything, anytime you can start with a thank you, it's a great way to start a meeting. Um, and, and it, it kind of gets their guard down a little bit, right? Because they have no idea what you're going to say. Um, so they're like, okay, we're, we're, we're in friendly territory. They might kind of, you know, chill out a little bit um, and be even more open than they, than they would otherwise. Um, you want to introduce your organization and its mission. So in this case, you're going to want to talk about California Free Thought Day. Um, and at the bottom of all of our one pagers, we do have, you know, a few lines about what the mission of California Free Thought Day is. And if you're representing another local group, you're going to want to mention that as well and their mission. Um, 
And also, of course, um, you know, if you identify, uh, you, I, I would just mention that you are, of course, you're a, a humanist or an atheist or secular um, and just, you know, talk about that. Um, and then you go into why you're meeting today. So the reason why I wanted to meet with you today is to discuss three bills that um, I really uh, uh, care about for these reasons. And yeah, so, and if you're in a group, you, you might wanna split that up, right? The first person talks about the first bill and the second and the third, if you're by yourself, you just go bill by bill. Um, so, and so if you have any personal connection to the issues that we're lobbying on, you're going to want to share those. Um, or maybe you have a secondhand friend or family members impacted. Again, um, compelling personal stories is, um, is just gold, right? There's just no replacing when you're talking to a human being, talking about how the issue personally impacts you. Um, you know, so if you have any, any personal experiences that take sort of this theoretical, these theoretical scenarios and make them real, you want to open with that and start with that. If you don't have any personal experiences to share, that's totally fine. You're going to want to, um, talk about at least why it matters to you, you know, why you were compelled to take the time to talk to them about these bills. Um, so you present the information um, and then you make the ask, right? Make sure you don't get through your whole thing where you explain the bill and you don't say, I, I, I urge representative so-and-so, I, I hope the Senator will consider co-sponsoring and supporting this bill when it comes up for a vote, right? That's, that's what we're there for, you gotta make the ask. And then once you do that, you ask, do you have any questions about any of these bills? Or I, I like to, open, especially because a lot of these, a lot of time, this is maybe the first time they've been introduced to your organization. I say something like, do you have any questions about the bills or about our organization? Or if you're unfamiliar with humanism or secularism, we're happy to answer any questions you might have, right? Because sometimes, um, you know, they might be a little, you know, think about being that person who doesn't really know what that is and you're afraid you don't want to offend the constituent. So I really like to open that door and make very clear, like, ask me anything. There's no stupid questions. I, you know, we love the opportunity to, um, you know, educate um, folks about what humanism and secularism is. And sometimes they might take you up on it. And that's really a wonderful opportunity. Um, and then at the end, you thank them again for their time, be super courteous, super kind. And then this is super important, especially if you're doing this in person, get a card, get a specific email address. Um, what is the best email? To, what is the best way to reach you? What's the best email to follow up? And you want their personal card. Um, a lot of you probably get action alerts in your inboxes from national orgs where you, you know, fill out your address. It knows your rep right away and it sends off a, a um, a letter. Those are great. You should keep doing those, but just know that generally those types of sort of autofill things that go into, they, they submit to the web form on the website of your legislators, right? And people do read those, but this is next level, right? Now you have a personal email address of a staffer that you are emailing to follow up with, when we'll talk about the follow-up in a second, and you're gonna have an email thread with them, right? That's a completely different level of access um, than sending something through a form letter, right? You're building a personal relationship, and the next time you email them and you reply to that last email that you sent to them, they'll see, they'll see oh, this is someone that I personally met with, right? Um, so that's why kind of building these relationships is so important. You know, doing this basically once a year with each, you know, each of your reps, and and find getting that email address of the staffer. Um, that that is your point of contact. That is just your entryway into being able to have direct access to someone in that office that you can talk to and follow up with, right? You don't have to meet with them in person every time. You already did and you built a relationship that you can continue via email and phone calls. Um, and then of course, yeah, I already mentioned be professional and courteous. So the follow-up, um, you really wanna strike when the iron is hot. They meet with lots of people. So you wanna follow up um, at least within two business days so that they remember you. Um, and of course you start by saying, thank you so much again for your time. It was really great to meet with you to discuss this, this, and this. I'd like to include, and we'll, we'll give you this to you as well. Um, you know, just reminding them exactly what they met us about, right? Because they might've met like 10 people that day and they remember you, but they don't remember the finer details of what was discussed. So always make it kind of as easy as possible for them to remember what was discussed, who you were. Um, 
And again, if they asked you any questions that you didn't know the answer to, or they asked for additional information, this is your opportunity to say, I know you had asked about X, Y, Z, you can find that information attached or at the link here. And then we, again, this is all gonna be in a template that we'll give you. Um, you say, you know, please let me know if there's anything, if there's any additional information I can provide that would be helpful. Um, and then what do you do from there? So you did your follow-up. So there's a lot of different opportunities to follow up. Um, you can, um, you know, update them if you know that there's movement on the bill. Um, you know, if you know that the bill is coming up for a vote, you can follow up and say, you know, just wanted to let you know that, that the bill is coming up for a vote. Is the senator or the representative going to be, um, you know, we, we hope that they'll be voting in support. Um, if, if the ask is to co-sponsor, you can follow up in a week or two and ask uh, if, if uh, the legislator has um, considered co-sponsoring yet. Because uh, sometimes, you know, it takes some time for this stuff to kind of uh, get, get um, you know, up the flagpole. And so being politely persistent, um, you know, you don't want to be calling them every day or anything like that, but you do your follow-up and then maybe you give it a week or two and then you follow up. And if you don't hear back, you follow up in a few days, maybe. And then if you don't hear back again, you call, you know, there's there's a whole song and dance to it. And, and we'll, we'll be with you every step of the way. But if you think about this outside of advocacy weekend, if this is something that I, I hope you'll consider doing for your other reps um, year round, um, you know, anytime there's an issue that is that comes up, maybe there's a news article that's really relevant that you want to make sure they saw, you can just pop in and send them an email and say, hey, I, I wanted you to see this article about this latest issue. This is something really concerned about. I want to make sure you're, this is on your office's radar. Um, so, um, and, and again, that's all part of being a resource, right? Establishing yourself as a person they can rely on for this kind of information. Because one day, if you do this over time, they might call you because it's like, oh, so-and-so who comes to our office once a year and emails us regularly, they're, they do all the church state separation stuff. We should, we should call them and, and see if they, their organization has a position on this issue. All right, so now we're ready to start talking about the bills. So some of you will already be familiar with this um, uh, because we lobbied on it last year, but for those of you um, who are new, um, this is a bill that actually um, passed um, the Senate. And so what we're trying to do is getting, getting it passed in the assembly. It is getting, um, it's caught up in appropriations and my understanding from one of the organizations leading on this bill is that they're expecting um, that it probably won't come up again uh, until August. So this is actually a great time to be lobbying for this because we're gearing up for when we hope that this moves out of appropriations in August. So SB 523, um, there's a lot more than, than what's here that, that it does, um, but some of the things that I think uh, I put here because I think it's particularly relevant to why we care about it is that it prevents religious employers from discriminating against individuals based on their reproductive health decision making, um, and, it just, and it makes it easier for individuals to fight back if they do experience that discrimination. Um, it expands um, uh, what insurance um, will cover. Um, including over-the-counter contraception, which is hugely important when it comes to addressing inequities and in access, particularly for, um, for people of color and low-income women um, who don't have, or people who live in rural areas who don't, can't so easily set an appointment and get a prescription for birth control. Um, so um, it also extends contraceptive coverage to, um, there were just kind of a lot of gaps. This is, you know, this is, even in a state like California, there's always room, right, to, to fill these gaps. Um, so really the bill will extend coverage to millions of Californians, including state workers, university employees, and college students. Um, so uh, like all of the bills, um, we're gonna want you to see if your legislator is already co-sponsor, because if they're already co-sponsor, it's just going to be an easy thank you talking about why this uh, issue matters and asking them to do everything they can to, um, to move the bill forward. The next one here, we've got AB 1666. Now, uh, if you've been following, um, uh, of course, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the Texas law um, that, um, you know, with, with the bounty on anybody who aids or abets an abortion. Um, in a nutshell, um, this, this bill basically create, would make 
California a safe haven for people who are coming from other states into California and basically saying, you know, what, what they're doing over there does not apply here. And it's really important um, to do that because without these kinds of pro legal protections by the state, um, individuals and providers who are involved in trying to help people trying to get abortions here um, will be worried about being sued and financially ruined. Um, and that's gonna have a real chilling effect unless there is the state is coming in and saying, you are protected within our state borders, their laws don't apply here. Um, <clears throat> and the first two bullet points here, just like I put in the, I'm gonna go back for a second. Um, oh, sorry, no. So the first two bullet points here, I put, um, you know, kind of the the why, right? Because and, and then I talk about, you know, what what it does and and, and why that the ask at the bottom. But I, I, again, I really want to emphasize that, you know, talking about why as a secular community we care about this issue um, is really important. Um, so, you know, I put here, and you can put this in your own words, like don't feel like you have to say exactly word for word these things. This is just kind of to guide you on how to have this conversation. So I put here, our community believes in the fundamental human right to bodily autonomy, including the right of an individual to make personal reproductive decisions, including abortion without interference from her employer, the government, religious institutions, or providers. Um, and then, you know, I think a, a lot of you were, were saying something very similar at the beginning here um, that, you know, kind of the bigger picture that there's a narrow Christian view in abortion that's being imposed on all Americans of all faiths and none. I say this to, um, remind folks that not all Christians and not all people of faith, you know, hold this perspective. Um, and, you know, bringing in the, the, the Supreme Court's conservative Christian majority. Um, this is, this is language, you know, if, if you're lobbying with a reproductive rights group, you're likely not going to see language like this. The rest of it about, you know, uh, the what, what the bill does and, and reproductive, you know, the importance of addressing these inequities, yes, but I do think it's important for us to bring a really unique secular perspective to why we care about this issue, because I do think that as secularists, as humanists, as atheists, the way that we view this issue um, is very much tied to our secular worldview, right, our bot, the, the passion with which we support bodily autonomy is very much coming from both, you know, not wanting religious beliefs imposed on us, um, but also, you know, humanism and, and secularists are, are very human centered. And we're, we, we, you know, I, bodily autonomy, that it's not a coincidence that secular communities not only broadly support um, choice when it comes to abortion, but also are really overwhelmingly supportive of medical aid and dying. And those things are connected because our community, it really resonates with us that, that your body is your own um, and no one else uh, should be telling you what you can do with it. Um, so, you know, really bring that to life um, in your own words, because I do think it's a perspective that folks don't always hear on this issue. Um, and they are hearing about this issue from other constituents and other groups. Um, but, you know, feel free to kind of really bring in your secular perspective there. And then the final one is ACA 6. Um, this is um, unique because this is actually, an, um, this would be an amendment to the California constitution, which is why the lettering looks different like that. Um, <clears throat> so what this bill would do is it would add um, instructions and materials um, and mandate that um, public schools uh, teach contextualized California Native American history and culture um, to students in grades three, four, eight, and 11. Um, and <clears throat> what, you know, contextualize um, means that they're not just, you know, uh, getting what they're getting now where they pretty much for, it seems for the most part, um, are only learning about Native American missions, but without really a whole lot of context um, or it's just altogether unaddressed. So having like a really, truthful, fully comprehensive, um, and historically accurate and culturally sensitive um, uh, education about California Native American history. And not just Native American history in the United States, but specifically where, where the students actually are and understanding you know, what land um, that they are on um, and the tribes um, that were uh, original to the land that where they are being schooled. Um, and, and again, you'll see at the beginning here that I started with kind of why, why it is that we as secularists 
um, you know, as part of Free Thought Day would support this issue. And you can put this in your own words, you might have a different reason, but the way I put it was that we believe in order to prepare students to live and contribute productively to our diverse pluralistic society, we must tell students the complete truth about our nation and our state's history. Without fully addressing the truth, we can't help eliminate these social injustices that have long been ignored and which persist today. Um, and so, you know, really bringing it back because for us, you know, as a community, we're, we're, we're usually talking about religious pluralism, but it is, you know, broadly applicable, this idea of, you know, how we, sh how the government and state policy should promote um, as much as possible, um, you know, having having our our students, but also just citizens generally live and coexist um, in uh, in a society that is pluralistic, right? We we want uh, our spaces, our schools, to be inclusive of all faiths and none, um, but we also want to make sure um, that we're we're under we're we're understanding across other differences and not just you know religious differences but also you know ethnic and cultural background um, and I would also add here that um, you know native spiritual beliefs are maybe not the religion that we think of where you go to a place and you pray um, but you know sacred spaces is really um, an element of you know spirituality and religiosity that's totally erased from the kind of broader conversation about religious freedom um, and so you know I, I think that this is very much related um, not just to church state separation but of course just you know our broader commitment to social justice um, so that's the way I put it you don't have to use these words you know bring it bring it home to why you care about this issue. So those are the three bills. So now I'm just gonna very quickly um, before uh, I uh, stop and, and um, I'll answer any questions you might have, um, just what's next, right? So advocacy week is in two weeks. And the reason we did that is because sometimes it takes time to hear back from these offices, right? Um, so you might have to contact them a few times. So um, I'll briefly tell you kind of how it's gonna go, but I'm not gonna go into too much detail because my associate, Jenna, Renee, who is wonderful, you're going to enjoy working with her. Um, she's going to be reaching out to all of you with a few things. One, she's going to give you the template email that you can use um, to contact your legislators. Um, and she's going to guide you through that process. And she's also going to, you know, be very politely but persistently following up with you to make sure that you actually schedule these meetings. Um, so, um, uh, just be be aware of that. Um, we we want to make sure that uh, you know we hold you accountable to uh, to the advocacy day registration <laughs> um, because uh, we we really want to make sure we're heard on these bills. So Jenna will be reaching out to you, uh, making sure that you schedule the meeting and helping you with anything you might need um, to to do that. Um, she's also going to be sending emails if you are. If you share a district with other people or share a representative with other people, um, she'll email you as a group. And some of you share a representative, but not the same senator. So, you know, you might get two different emails for two different groups where you have that overlap. Um, so she'll take care of that. And then, you know, it'll just be on you to kind of coordinate with each other to find a time that works. And I really encourage doing these in person if you can, but if anyone doesn't feel comfortable doing that, um, or doesn't feel safe or for COVID reasons or any other reason, that's totally fine. You can do this virtually and a lot of offices are doing um, virtual meetings. In fact, there might be some that aren't even doing in-person meetings at the district office. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure right now. Um, so um, you'll get those instructions. Basically, you're gonna request a meeting and you're going to introduce yourself and just say, you know, I'd like to uh, have a meeting with um, Senator or Representative so and so or, or whatever staff you have available in the district to talk about these bills. Um, and then if you don't hear back, you're going to have to follow up by email again. And if you don't hear back, you'll follow up by email again. And that at that point, you're going to make a phone call. Um, and you're going to say, hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm a constituent. I contacted so-and-so at this email address requesting a meeting on this date, this date, and this date. But I haven't heard back yet. Who's the best person to talk to, right? The reason I said that that way, and I wanted you to hear me say it, is because you really want to be polite no matter what you know, no matter how annoyed you are that it's like the fourth or fifth time that you might be contacted. And it may not take that many times, but sometimes it does. Um, Louis uh, will, from last year will can attest to that, but sometimes it takes a lot of persistence. Um, so it's really just about, 
you know, spacing out those follow-ups so that they have a few business days. And then, because the first thing, if, if you, the first, if the first thing you do is call them, they're going to, they're just going to give you an email address. So you want to kind of go through all the steps that they've set up for you to request the meetings so that you can say, yes, I did all of these things. Now, can you help me, you know, uh, schedule a meeting, right? So we'll get through that. You'll get that meeting scheduled. Ideally, we'd like you to schedule it during the advocacy week. So when you do request the meeting, you're going to ask for those date ranges. But if it doesn't work for you, or it doesn't work for the office, or maybe you're in a group and you know not everyone can make it that day, that's fine. The most important thing is that you have the meeting in the next few weeks. Um, and then you're going to prepare for the meeting as we've discussed. Um, you're going to be given a um, uh, a one pager and talking points for each bill. So what is a one pager? It is literally one page that explains everything um, that the legislator or their staff need to know about the bill. And um, that is something you are going to attach to an email um, when you follow up with them. Um, the reason I like to do it in the follow up and there's nothing wrong with attaching it when you request the meeting, but you kind of want to like not have an excuse for them not to have the meeting with you. Uh, so I, I like to give the, the follow up, uh, give it in the follow up instead of um, up front. The talking points are not for the legislator or the staff, right? Talking points are for you as a reference during your meeting and you don't want to like print it out and read from it. Um, I mean, you can have it in front of you, but make sure you're not like reading a script, you know, you're having a, a conversation with a human being. So that's really just for you to use as a reference. You do not have to hit every single talking point. Um, you just, you know, and you don't have to say it word for word, you know, put it in your own voice. Um, use the talking points that speak to you the most. Just make sure that you hit the the problem we're trying to solve, you know, the why uh, this matters to you and what the bill does and make the ask. Those are the most important elements. So just a reminder, again, do not attach the talking points. Um, you're just attaching the one pager. That is um, what's for the staff. And you'll notice that there's a lot of the same information in both, but one of the key differences between what we put in your talking points and what we put in the one pager is that the talking points are a lot more focused on sort of the why and our kind of unique secular free thought day perspective on why we're supporting the bills. Whereas the one pagers are just kind of the straight facts uh, about the bill and everything that they need to know about it. Um, so um, you'll, in closing, you're gonna hear from Jenna um, probably starting tomorrow. Um, all of the one pagers and the talking points are actually on the free thought day website. Um, so David, I don't know if you wanna share your screen really quick. I can stop sharing mine. Um, and we'll show that. And then um, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. So while you're typing your questions into the chat, uh, this is what um, what Sarah was talking about. If you go to our website and it's is right there, front and center, Secular Advocacy Week. If you click on that, that'll take you to information about today and the week. Some of that's going to disappear soon because it's obviously outdated. And then right down, we have information about the three different bills that we're supporting this week or this month. And each one of these three has buttons underneath. You can go to the official text of the full bill from the state website. Underneath that or beside that, we have the talking points that Sarah was talking about. You can click on that, download the PDF and print it. That's the one that you're going to keep for yourself. And you have the summary. And I'll just click on one of these to show you what it looks like. And it looks like this. So just a one pager, as Sarah said, about that particular bill. Feel free to download it, and you know if you have any technical issues, don't hesitate to reach out to me or Sarah or her, or her assistant. And if you scroll down a little bit further, you'll see the same thing. Just in case you have problems with the buttons up above, it's even in one convenient zip file. If you know how to use zip files, you can just download the zip file, and all six files are there together. All right, Sarah, back to you. All right, great. I only see uh, one question um, that I haven't answered yet in the chat, which I do think is important for everyone to see, which is uh, Lynn's question. Any suggestions for managing contact with reps that are not open to supporting what we're presenting? My local state and national reps take opposing positions. So that is very different, right? So I think that what you do there, excuse me, is you kind of, you know, what, how I approach that um, is, you know, you, the way you request the meeting is actually the, the same, um, as you would for anybody else, but the way you approach, um, the meeting, um, is to, 
uh, kind of just acknowledge, you know, at the beginning, they're still going to be polite to you, your constituent. Um, so what I would do is do something like say, I know that uh, the center of the representative may not, uh, uh, you know, align with our position, but, you know, just being a constituent, I did want to make sure um, that, um, that, you know, my perspective and my community's perspective is heard. Right. So, you know, that that's how I would suggest doing it. Right. Like just, you know, you don't want to go in and just pretend right that 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 you're going to get a, a different answer. But I think they will res they will hear you out and they will respect that. And I, the reason that's important to do is that visibility factor. Right. It's still important to show up and for them to know where we stand. Um, so that that would be my answer to that. All right, cool. And there was a, a good question also from Daniel that uh, just popped up. Uh, will the bills affect or be affected by redistricting? You know, and I know that that's an issue like in, in my area right now, we've got a, a the whole thing has changed. And, uh, you know, I, I don't even know who our representative may be, especially at the federal level. Like that's that's all in the up, up in the air right now. So that's, that's a good question. We're going to try our best to get you the information that's accurate at the time, and you're going to be making appointments right away. So hopefully it won't make a difference, but who knows, by the time these people vote on these bills, they may have lost their district just because of the way that the boundaries were redrawn. And we may have to go back to the new person who may have been the representative from the county next door to you, who then now has inherited your area. So that can be a challenge too. Um, we are going to close out, but like I said, there are just a couple quick announcements. First, Sarah, I want to thank you again so much for making all of this happen. Um, I want to just let everyone know you're going to get a follow-up email with a link to the recording from today, and then you're going to get you know all kinds of emails um, from Sarah and her assistant to help you uh, get this rolling along. Uh, a couple other quick announcements. Uh, remember that we've got scholarships available for high school and college students. We've got $2,000 to give away over the summer. If you know anyone who might want to apply, please direct them to our website. They can do so, the deadlines and all the information are there on our website at freethoughtday.org. Also, if you like lobbying for your state rights, you should try lobbying for your federal rights because the American Humanist Association and American Atheists are partnering next month to do the same thing that we're doing this month. Uh, we got our idea from them, but we just happened to do it sooner. So if this is of interest to you at the federal level, please visit American Atheists or American Humanist Association online. And their website has all kinds of details, how you can register for their lobbying uh, event. And theirs, just like ours, can be done remotely. And of course, don't forget about California Free Thought Day happening in person in Sacramento at our state capitol on Sunday, October 9th. We don't have much information yet, but we hope to in just a couple weeks about our speakers, live entertainment, authors and podcasters, and all the other things that go along with it. If you haven't been to Free Thought Day before, or maybe you only attended the last couple of years when it was online, I highly encourage you to come and check it out. There'll be information about lodging and everything else on our website within the month. Of course, I encourage all of you to follow us on all social media platforms at Freethought Day, or just visit our website at freethoughtday.org. Sarah, again, thank you so much for everything and all of you. Uh, we have almost, well, we had 22 people register. Most of you made it tonight and we're gonna still be promoting this in the, in the next week to come. I encourage all of you to reach out to your friends and your neighbors who you know are also passionate about these and give them the link to register for the week so that we can put them in touch with Sarah and her assistant as well. Thank you so much for being a part of this. I really appreciate it on behalf of secular Californians everywhere, if I may do that. I hope you have a great evening and good luck with everything. I can't wait to hear how this goes for all of you. Sarah, thanks again. Everyone have a great evening. Thank you, Thank you so much. Good night.